Executive Director of the Michigan Masonic Charitable Foundation, and we're here today recording another session in our Legacy Series, recordings of interviews of past Grand Masters of the Grand Lodge of Michigan. With us today is Most Worshipful Brother Richard Sands, who served as Grand Master in 1985 and 1986. Most Worshipful Brother Richard, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to have you with us here today. It's a pleasure to be here. We want to start at the very beginning. Tell us where you were born. I was born in San Diego, California on September 28, 1929, just before the Depression. Just before the, you didn't cause the Depression, did you? No. Oh, that's good. Tell me about your parents. My father was William Robert Sands. He was born in Brimfield, Indiana in 1885. And uh, he uh, went two years to Notre Dame but uh, would not accept the Catholic faith. So his father disinherited him, and that was the end of his college career. He went to work as a uh, um, fireman on, on the railroad. And uh, that lasted perhaps four, four or five years, and then he joined the Marine Corps. And he was stationed in Washington, D.C. and. Uh, he was in the quartermaster section of the Marine Corps, and uh, he met a model in Washington whom he married. Her name was Edith Hamlet, and they had the one uh, boy, William Robert Sands Jr., whom the family called Bob Jr. And uh, unfortunately, my father worked too much. He wasn't home. She started to wander. He divorced her. But then she wouldn't leave him alone. So he uh, went to a senator friend from Indiana and asked the senator if he could get him transferred overseas so that he'd get away from her. Well, the senator did him one better. The senator got him put on leave from the Marine Corps and appointed as a diplomatic courier before and during World War I. So he was stationed in London and went in and out of uh, Russia during this period. He uh, faced the firing squad three times, in which they cut everybody down but him, looking for information. The, uh, uh, when, uh, when he ended after, after World War I, he went back into the active Marine Corps and uh, was stationed in, in Haiti. And he picked up uh, double pneumonia and typhoid fever at the same time. Well, he virtually died. Uh, they already put him out in the hall because he didn't have any pulse. And uh, a doctor froze a dental mirror and stuck it under his nose and it fogged up. So they put him back in bed. <laughs> and he remembers when they picked him up and took him out of the ice bath, but he never knew when they put him in because he was always unconscious. Uh, but in any event, uh, he had to retire early from the Marine Corps because his lungs were pretty well damaged. So he retired after 20 years in the Marine Corps. In fact, he retired the year before I was born. My mother was Laura Bell Evans. She was an English teacher in high school. And in fact, she was the principal of South Pasadena High School when they met. And the way they met was that the, the women were urged to write letters to the servicemen in that time uh, just to lift their morale. Well, she did that and wrote an anonymous letter, and uh, it was given to a private in my father's company. And it was clear from the letter that this woman was highly educated. She wrote very good English. So the private went to my father, who had had two years of college. <laughs> <laughs> asked him if he would help him draft a letter in, in response, which he did. Well, this went on for several exchanges of letters until finally my mother wanted to meet him, and he got cold feet. So he asked my father to write a letter and apologize and uh, to fess up to this charade, which he did, and he sent a picture of himself. He was a very handsome man, as a matter of fact. Um, well, my mother to be was furious. She went down to the dime store and got a picture of the blackest woman she could find and signed it, Love Laura, and sent it back. <laughs> well, 
my father wasn't fooled because he knew no black woman in that era could write English that well. So, so they finally she came around and they met, and uh, they got married in 1927, and I was born in 29. Uh, my father, as I said, retired the year before I was born. Both my father and mother were 45 when I was born. And uh, my mother wanted to continue to teach because she wanted to earn her retirement from California. Uh, and the doctor told my father that uh, he would breathe much easier in the mountains than he would down in San Diego. So, so we moved to Crestline, California. And Crestline was at 5,500 feet in the San Bernardino Mountains. It was dead north of San Bernardino, up a 15-mile-long winding road. And uh, my uh, father loved his Freemasonry. Uh, he was uh, raised a Master Mason in Point Loma Lodge, just north part of San Diego. And in fact, I visited there when I was in Grand Line. And I was very pleasantly surprised uh, in the foyer of that lodge they have a picture of every man, a passport-sized picture of every man that was raised in that lodge in a portfolio. Wow. And um, so on page one was my father, and on page two was my brother. He was a half-brother. <laughs> so that was quite a wonderful experience. But I've never had such a hard time to get into any lodge as I did then, because they couldn't ask me any question I didn't know the answer to, and they weren't about to quit until they found a question that I could answer. <laughs> so that was fun for everybody. Yeah. Right? In any event, uh, my father loved his Freemasonry. We lived 15 miles up a winding road from the nearest lodge, so he never went to lodge, but he practiced his Freemasonry. And he was retired, and my father, my mother was teaching. So I would go with him everywhere. And I got so I could recognize a Mason as soon as he could. All right? <laughs> and and uh, so uh, in later years, uh, I'll tell you how I got started in Freemasonry. But uh, um, my mother being an English teacher in high school, spoke excellent English. And so my grades in English were always superb. And the reason was that I, if I came to a question, I simply asked myself, how would my mother have said this? And I was 100% right every time. <laughs> so that was great. <laughs> but uh, we lived uh, up 15 miles on the winding road, and I went to grammar school in, in uh, Crestline, but after that's through the first eight grades. After that, I had to take the bus down, 15 miles down, 15 miles back. <laughs> in any event, uh, the uh, I had no siblings since my parents were 45 when I was born, so I had no other siblings. You did have a half brother, though, you'd say. I had a half brother, and I had never met him until uh, my junior year of high school. That had to be an interesting experience. Yeah, right. So you told us where you went to grade school. Where did you go to middle school and high school then? Uh, the high school at that time was four grades, 9 through 12. Not 10 through 12, which is nowadays more common. Uh, that was San Bernardino High School. And uh, the total enrollment was around 1,200 at the time that I went there. Big school. Very good. So, growing up and participating in school activities, did you were you into sports or band or any school clubs? I couldn't because I was 15 miles away. I had to catch the bus. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't have any of that. No, no such enjoyments. So after high school, you went immediately to college, or did you work for a while? Well, I went to work as an apprentice dye maker. And uh, I also ran a zinc casting machine at the same time in order to earn money for college. And uh, when I was actually, this was in the summers that I did this, 
uh, in the wintertime, I worked uh, in the uh, uh, local cafeteria as a waiter. Uh, but in the summers, I, I uh, was an apprentice dye maker, and then in the evenings, I ran a zinc casting machine. So, uh, so between that and school, you kept yourself very busy. Very busy. Where did you go to school? I went to the University of Redlands, which is a small Baptist college. Redlands is about 60 miles inland from Los Angeles, straight east of Los Angeles, just on the edge of the desert. What did you study there? Physics. That shouldn't be a surprise to me. So, when did you meet your first wife, Emma? She was the head waitress at this cafeteria. Okay. So that's uh, where I met her, and it turns out that I had been going steady with a girl in high school. Uh, during my senior year of high school, uh, I met her uh, because uh, I decided I wanted to play mixed doubles. And she'd signed up for the same, and we got put together. So that was my first really full girlfriend, and we continued through almost four years of college. And I, I came to the point where there wasn't anything that she could do that I didn't anticipate, and I decided that just went. And furthermore, it turns out I found out that I really loved her mother more than I did her, so it was time to cut. And when I did that, I... Uh, went after Emma. And uh, she was a very striking woman, uh, straight as, as a rod. And the reason is her mother, her grandmother, made her walk with, with a uh, broomstick behind her elbows, and she had to do everything around the house this way with that broomstick behind her elbows. She was just, just as straight as erect as be. So a very striking woman. And, so when did you guys get married? Uh, in August 11th of 1951 in Bakersfield, California, which was her hometown, in the First Baptist Church there. And you had some children? We had four. Uh, Robert Michael, uh, uh, then Christine Elizabeth, then Karen Louise, and finally William Thomas. And uh, they were about two years apart. And uh, the uh, my older boy was extremely independent. He didn't want his father to put him through school, so he wanted to join one of the military academies. And so he got two appointments from the representatives, from, from the two senators, he had an appointment to the Naval Academy, and from the representative, he had an appointment to the Naval Academy. So he had three appointments to the Naval Academy. Well, it so happens that my half-brother had gone through the Naval Academy. And the more my son thought about this, the more he thought he didn't want anybody spying on him at the Naval Academy. So he announced after he'd gotten these correctional appointments that he uh, uh, was going to go to the Air Force Academy. Well, it turns out that he had won uh, all state honors in water polo, and the Air Force Academy was just starting water polo as a varsity sport, so they offered him an athletic appointment to the Air Force Academy, so he did all on his own without any congressional appointments. Very good. Uh, and uh, he went through the Air Force Academy, uh, and uh, he uh, was stationed, at, among other places, at uh, Shaw Air Force Base in Sumter, South Carolina. And his, uh, he, he married a lady there, and she didn't want to leave Sumter, so he had to turn down several opportunities to move, and that cost him promotions, and so he didn't, he didn't make a, a major, which was necessary if he wanted to go past 20 years. So he retired after 20 years. And, uh, and then it so happens that the husband of his then wife um, was in the real estate business, and so he uh, taught my son um, everything about the real estate business that he knew, and and my son finally joined with an older man. But uh, what happened was that the banks decided that they were going to do their own appraisal about this time, 
And so the business dropped off and uh, he thought that he owed it to the senior man to get out of the business so that he had enough business to support him. So there he was with nothing except his uh, computer education at the Air Force. So he, uh, he took uh, Microsoft's nine-step course on computers and taught himself computers and got a job, surprisingly enough. Um, he was, uh, uh, his first job was, uh, was to put the, uh, the automobile inventory for uh, 16 uh, used car lots on the internet so that the owner knew everything was everywhere in his business. And uh, so he was very lucky in that regard. He, he had an opportunity to increase his education and, and finally got a job as, a, as an IT man. Um, and uh, then what happened is that he, uh, the, the, the uh, cutback in, in the economy was such that uh, the company he was working for had to let him go, although they didn't want to. So he got excellent letters of recommendation, but it took him about a year to get a job. And he finally got a job uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and um, so that's where he is now. So that covers my son. He has a, uh, he remarried and uh, has a, a son, William, who's now uh, 14. Christine, who is number two, uh, went through medical school at the University of Michigan, got her MD, and, and in anesthesiology because she knew that she could be home in the afternoons to greet her future children. So that's what she chose to do, and she still is an anesthesiologist in California. Uh, my younger daughter, Karen, went through U of M undergraduate school with a uh, applied math computer science major and she's doing, still doing this. She makes over 200 grand a year. She's doing very well. Uh, and uh, she, uh, she uh, married, had three boys and uh, when they uh, got through college she uh, decided she didn't love her husband anymore and asked for a divorce. And uh, so she's still seeing the, uh, my younger boy is number two in the Michigan State Police. He's a, a lieutenant colonel in the Michigan State Police. Uh, they've done very well by him. And, uh, and uh, so I would guess very much that he's probably going to be the next colonel. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, he has he has three children, an older girl who's married and has a child, so I'm a great grandfather. In fact, I have four great grandchildren and sixteen grandchildren. Wow, big family. So <clears throat> later on uh, in life, you had the opportunity to uh, marry another wonderful woman, Mary. Um, the, how did that come about? That came about because uh, Mary was uh, married to uh, Nick Spiewak, who happened to be the master of my lodge. So uh, I knew Mary and Nick, and Emma and I both knew them for about 20 years, and my first wife had a very high opinion of her. So uh, after my first wife died of metastatic kidney cancer in 1997, um, I got a letter of sympathy from Mary, and uh, I suddenly realized that I loved her, and uh, so I went after her. <laughs> she said yes, so we... Very good. When, we, when did you guys get married? Uh, yeah, on uh, June 19th of 1998. Very good. So let's go back to your working life. Uh, you mentioned your first job was as an apprentice. Uh, take us through your working life. Well, I spent uh, four years as an apprentice dye maker and also running a zinc casting machine. Uh, and um, 
then it turns out that, uh, that I applied for several graduate schools, and the only one that offered me financial support was Washington University in St. Louis, which it turned out as a, was an excellent choice for me because they had great, great teachers. And uh, so I thoroughly enjoyed my graduate school experience. And uh, uh, one of my professors had a photographic memory. And I don't know whether you've ever seen anyone with a photographic memory, but he read letters of recommendation at about this rate. And I'm not exaggerating. And he'd read half a dozen of these or more and then could quote them back to you verbatim. And he'd memorized 50 years of scientific journals in physics. If you went in and asked him where you could learn about anything, he would tell you the journal, the year, the page, and the authors and the subject, and then proceed to tell you what they had to say. <laughs> Photographic memory. I've never seen that since. It just uh, mind boggles your mind. You wonder why you could be so stupid and be so smart. That's amazing. Uh, but in any event, uh, I went to graduate school when the veterans were going through. And they were very serious because they all had families and they just wanted to get out as soon as possible to get a job. So the laboratory <clears throat> was busy, all except for maybe three to five in the morning, except for those that was just running constantly. So the result of that was I got a doctorate in four years. And um, the, uh, I, my thesis professor, at the time, had an offer from Stanford University to come visit for a year. And he didn't want uh, his research to stop. And I was graduating, so he offered me a assistant research scientist position to go with him to continue his research in Stanford that he was doing there at Washington University. I jumped at the chance, and uh, the uh, uh, I had a, what happens when you go to a new university, you're expected to give a colloquium. And the only thing I knew uh, was my thesis work. So I gave a colloquium on my thesis. And I should step back a minute and tell you how this occurred. Uh, my thesis professor and another one, Jack Townsend there at Washington U, had built a microwave spectrometer um, to look at uh, electron paramagnetic resonance, it's called, in uh, free radicals. And they built it for a biology professor by the name of Barry Commoner. So they were putting biological samples into Pyrex test tubes and putting them in the machine. And it turns out the signals from the Pyrex test tubes were so much larger than from the biological samples. <laughs> they finally went to courts. And my, my, uh, then thesis professor, I was doing nuclear magnetic resonance at the time. My thesis professor says, I wonder what's causing all those signals in Pyrex. And I piped up and said, if you give me a PhD for it, I'll tell you. He says, you got a deal. <laughs> so I wrote to Corning Glass Works. Corning made me several doped glass, uh, uh, glasses with paramagnetic ions. And so I wrote a thesis on paramagnetic ions in glass. And when I got to Stanford, I gave my colloquium on paramagnetic ions in glass. And it so happened that Varian Associates, which is a small electronics firm that, that uh, had, was leasing space from Stanford grounds, came to the colloquium. And after the colloquium, they offered me a, a consulting job. Now, you need to understand why this was so attractive. Is uh, in, in at Stanford, the wages for assistant research scientists and instructors were uh, thirty eight hundred, four thousand, and forty two hundred dollars for each of the first three years. And I had at that time, I, I had uh, two children, and uh, my wife was not working. So needless to say, a consulting job was uh, very attractive. But the reason they offered me a consulting job is it turned out that Corning Glassworks had contracted to them to extend my thesis research. 
<laughs> talk about accidents, all right? Exactly. So uh, I went to work consulting for Varian Associates. Their, um, their reason for existing was that uh, they had been, there were two Varian brothers, uh, Russell and Sigurd, who were working for a Sperry gyroscope making uh, klystrons and magnetrons for radar. And it turns out the Perry gyroscope was milling the resonant cavities out of solid brass. And these guys got the idea of stamping them out of uh, thin conducting material, which obviously is so much faster and cheaper, they, they put Sperry gyroscope out of business. So that's what they were doing. That's where it's their mainstay. But it turns out that they, being on Stanford grounds, uh, they were um, interested in research. And so they, they had a research department that was uh, doing nuclear magnetic resonance and they were building um, a microwave spectrometer for electron paramagnetic resonance which I could tell you about, but in any event, uh, uh, I had an opportunity to, to consult for them, and they were advertising the application of these magnetic resonance techniques to the public, and they were getting letters from biologists and biochemists, and the people at Varian Associates were either engineers or physicists, so they had no idea how to answer these letters. And so somebody up in the upper echelon says, what do we have consultants for if it isn't to solve our problem? Send the letters to Dick Sands, tell them to answer. <laughs> I bothered to learn enough biology and biochemistry to answer the letters, and one thing led to another. And uh, I began to work with a man from the University of Wisconsin who was just outstanding. His name was Helmut Beinert. And um, uh, we had exactly what he needed in terms of uh, research tools. And uh, uh, after my stint at, uh, at Stanford, I uh, was offered a position at the University of Michigan. And we can talk about that later. Okay. Well, let's move into that. Uh, you had a long and distinguished career at the University of Michigan as a physics professor. Why don't you tell us how that came about? Well, it came about in the following way. My mother had a brother who had a fruit farm uh, outside of uh, Benton Harbor, Michigan, and he died. And uh, so uh, we uh, were leasing the farm to a neighbor farmer. And the first year, the neighbor farmer made money. But after that, he didn't make any money anymore. So I decided that I could kill two birds with one stone by taking a system professorship in Michigan, uh, because then I could go check up on him and see what the real truth was. Well, it so happens he started making money after, after this <laughs> So it worked out just fine. Um, but in any event, that, that was one of my motivations for accepting a job at Michigan. What, what year was that? 1957, the fall of 57. And I, I spent 37 years at the University of Michigan teaching physics. And I enjoyed every minute of it, both teaching and research. I turned out 19 PhDs, which is quite a record. Uh, and uh, the reason for this, by the way, is if you're at a research university such as Michigan, you're expected to have a uh, uh, federal research grants which will support the students. They get paid a stipend in physics. And so you have to support the students not only financially, uh, but also by providing them with adequate equipment and supplies. So you have to have a grant for this, and the federal government is the main source. The state does a little, but the federal government. So what's the process when you're teaching in a university to become a full professor? How does that work? A research university promotes primarily on your publications. Uh, these are peer-reviewed, and so, uh, so they stand as a very solid record of your ability as a research scientist, they don't say anything about your ability to teach. 
Um, so it depends on the philosophy that's current in the department as to how much uh, credit they give to teaching when it comes time to promoting you. And the usual thing in physics is that you will get promoted from assistant to associate professor, which gives you tenure after five years. And then the promotion another four or five years to full professor. That's typically the way it goes. And these promotions, as I said, are based primarily upon your publication record. Although I was pleased to discover that in Michigan, they put a lot of emphasis on the teaching. And since I loved both, it was great. Good. <clears throat> you spent uh, a period as the head of the physics department at the University of Michigan. Well, there's a story to this. We had a number of very distinguished physicists as chairman of the department. But they didn't understand that they had to support the faculty to the hierarchy of the university. And the result was that the faculty were not getting the seed money that they needed. And, and so they weren't getting the financial support. And the research was gradually going downhill. In fact, it was so bad that we had approximately 50 faculty. And uh, the uh, total number of research grants uh, was uh, uh, about less than a thousand dollars a faculty member, very, very poor. So uh, uh, my colleagues in the department were complaining loudly about this. Now, it so happens that, that, as I told you earlier, I was working with an enzyme chemist, a biologist from the University of Wisconsin. So when I came to Michigan, he brought his samples to Michigan rather than to fly all the way to California for, to work with, at Varian Associates. Well, he ended up um, enthusing me in biophysics. So I switched from atomic physics to biophysics after about uh, seven years. And uh, I was, it turns out that, that um, after Sputnik, the, uh, the state was very much concerned about science and it started the Institute of Science and Technology at the University of Michigan. And they hired an outstanding biologist to head up a biophysics division of the Institute of Science and Technology, which uh, was a completely separate organization from the university proper. It was, it was housed on North Campus, and the uh, physics department was in literature, science, and the arts, which was on the main campus of the university. So uh, I needed the uh, equipment to prepare biological samples that was available in the biophysics research division. So I moved my laboratory, which was now predominantly biophysics, to the North Campus. And the result was that whenever I needed any support from the university, I went through the hierarchy of the Institute of Science and Technology and not the hierarchy of the College of Literature, Science and the Arts. Well, I had been there 20 years and had never asked for anything that I didn't get out of the university. The support was just outstanding. Well, I told this to my colleagues and they didn't believe me. They said, all right, wise guy, you take the chairmanship, <laughs> see what you can do. So I did. And uh, I was very fortunate. The Dean of, of Literature, Science and the Arts was a biologist. Billy Fry was his name. He knew the needs of the science department. So it was easy for me to justify uh, various things. And, and when I took the chairmanship, uh, I, um, I asked him for one and a half million, or one and a half million dollars, to to upgrade the shop, because we had no computer-controlled machines, for example, it was sadly inferior. I upgrade the shop and, and put in overhead cranes to handle heavy materials, and uh, also he gave me five faculty appointments, and. Uh, 
Included among these was a man by the name of Larry Sulak, who was an assistant professor at Harvard and didn't get tenure. So we gave him tenure and an associate professorship, and he brought with him the idea of the proton lifetime experiment. Now, it turns out the, that there are several theories in physics about the fundamental forces, and one of those theories was predicting that the the proton was unstable and, in fact, had a half-life of 10 to the 31 years. So you don't have to worry about it, okay? The universe is only 10 to the 10th years old, so we don't have to worry about this. But the point is that if you had a pot of 10 to the 33rd protons, if the half-life is 10 to the 31 years, then in one year about 100 of these protons should decay. So you ought to be able to see it. So, it turns out that, that uh, Larry Sulak had the idea of how to do this, and we had, at the time, several of the high-energy physicists who uh, were changing fields, so they joined Larry Sulak on this proton lifetime experiment. And um, the way the experiment was done is to build a huge swimming pool that corresponded to about 10 Olympic-sized swimming pools stacked on top of one another. And uh, this needed to be in an area that didn't have a lot of cosmic ray background. So a salt mine was an ideal place. So they went down to Cleveland and arranged uh, to dig a uh, huge uh, pool. And for this, they needed a digging machine. And it so happens that, that there was one on a freighter in mid-Atlantic that was taking a digging machine to London. And the people in London decided that they didn't want it. And if we could come up with $100,000, they would turn the freighter around and deliver this digging machine to Cleveland. Well, I went to the vice president for research, which is where the source of research money is at the university. And we asked him for $100,000 to turn this freighter around, and this was to be the university's contribution to the research grant. And the only thing that uh, I was asked was, what are you going to do if you don't get the grant? And we said, well, the, the uh, salt company had voiced an interest in renting the machine. All he asked, wrote a check for 100 grand. <laughs> it so happens that the uh, this was enough support, and the whole community was anxious to find out whether the proton was really stable or not. And uh, so we got a, they got a research grant of about $3 million, $3 million the first year, so the university got its own grant back. Very good. Tell us about uh, any um, community organizations or uh, memberships well, that you have. I... What happened to me is the following. I was uh, at the university for something like five or six years, and uh, I grew tired of what I call the ivory towerism in the university. People talk incessantly about their specialties, but very little about the world at large. So I wanted to get into the community and broaden my uh, uh, interactions in this fashion. And uh, I knew that my father had loved his Freemasonry, and he had told me the one thing I needed to know, which was if I ever wanted to join Freemasonry, uh, I had to ask. Then there were, uh, and as I indicated to you earlier, uh, as a child, I learned to recognize a Mason as soon as my father did. So I knew several Masons in my church, which was the First Baptist Church of Ann Arbor. So I went to them and said, I'd like to join Freemasonry, and what lodge would you recommend? So we had three in town at the time. Uh, so that, that's how I got started in Freemasonry, and I think I lost track of the question you asked me. What was that now? <clears throat> Did you belong to any other community organizations? Uh, Lions, Rotary? No, and you have to understand why. Uh, a full pro a professorship in a uh, research university 
is is a 24/7 job, and uh, I had absolutely no time uh, until I earned tenure, at which point I could make the time. So I, I was active in my in my church, but that's all. Okay. So when you um, made the decision to join the lodge, when was that? Uh, 1964. And um, which lodge did you petition? I petitioned Golden Rule Lodge, number 159, which at the time was the largest lodge in the, in the town. Okay. And <clears throat> did you get active in the lodge right away? or? Yes, and uh, now I need to explain why. In 1961, I had a stroke, and I lost the whole right side. I couldn't pick an arm up in bed and put it in my stomach. There's just nothing. Okay, I just lost the whole right side, uh, and and uh, one of the consequences of a stroke is that you lose your short-term memory. You still have long-term memory, but no short-term memory. So uh, I thought, well, the best thing I could do was to get into the officer line because that would force me to memorize. Well, I did, and it did. But it was interesting that if I didn't repeat a ritual in three weeks, it was like I had never seen it before. Literally, everything was gone. So I went through the officer line in my lodge, having to rememorize the ritual almost constantly. And uh, uh, I did virtually everything. That is to say, I did. Uh, I did uh, the. Uh, uh, Burial ceremonies, the memorial ceremonies, uh, the, uh, and and I began to install uh, lodges once I became master, and uh, from one year to the next, I could not remember the installation ceremony. It's like I'd never seen it before, so I had to memorize the whole thing. All, you know, and it's an hour plus ceremony. Well, this went on, and exactly 30 years after I'd had a stroke, I was down at my home in South Carolina, and we have a second home down there, and uh, the starlings had gotten in to the Martin house, and you can't scare the starlings away, you have to kill them. So I got out my 22. And uh, as you probably know, is, is uh, one of the consequences of a stroke is, is the feedback for the muscles is out of phase, and so you get the shakes. And uh, so I could never uh, go bow hunting because there would be like this trying to shoot a deer. And uh, I picked up this 22, and lo and behold, I was stable as a rock. <laughs> I could pick off these. These two starlings that were on the on the birdhouse about sixty feet away, and and uh, at the very same time, my short term memory came back. Wow! So I could remember the installation ceremony from one year to the next. So person. did you realize it instantly that you weren't shaken, or did it take you a minute to think about that? Oh, it took a minute to realize. My goodness, I got solid. <laughs> wow! So you said you went into the line right away. What year did you become master? 1971. 1971? Yeah. Any special memories of that year? Well, I had several things that I was very pleased with. Uh, for example, at that time, the Grand Secretary sent every lodge a list of sojourning masons in your town. And uh, so uh, I asked a, a brother in the lodge if he would make appointments for me to visit two of these sojourning masons every Tuesday night. Uh, my lodge went on Thursday night, all right, so we picked another night, Tuesday night. And so he did. And so I visited these sojourning masons every Tuesday night. And being in Ann Arbor, we had lots of them, all right. And um, of course, I invited them to come, come to lodge, which about half of them did. and. Uh, so it was a it was a very nice experience. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And uh, but unfortunately, the grand secretary doesn't do that anymore. So the lodges don't have this list of sojourning masons. Yeah, it's too bad. That's a great idea. What dependent and affiliated Masonic organizations do you belong to? 
virtually everyone. I, I uh, uh, joined a chapter, uh, uh, and, and I should say one other thing. Uh, in Ann Arbor, uh, we have a grotto club, and uh, it is, it, it's the center of social activities for the lodges in the surrounding community as well as Ann Arbor. So, so I joined uh, uh, Zalgaz Grotto uh, at, right after I was raised a Master Mason. And I also joined Chapter uh, and enjoyed that ritual very much because it, it explains a lot about Lodge work. And uh, I subsequently joined uh, Council and Commandery. So that covers the Yorkrite. And uh, I uh, later on joined the Scottish Rite, and uh, actually became a thrice potent master in, in the Lodge of Perfection in the uh, Scottish Rite. But that's as far as I went. I, I was on the Board of Trustees of Scottish Rite after I finished as thrice potent master. For the benefit of those who may not know, because it's not as well known as some of the other appendant bodies, can you tell us a little bit about the grotto? Uh, the grotto is very much like the shrine, except that at the time, the shrine required that that uh, you go either go through the York Rite or the Scottish Rite to join Shrine, whereas the Grotto has only required that you be a Master Mason. Uh, and the Grotto is also very supportive of Blue Lodge. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but it's local. That is to say, the Grottos are in the local community Whereas the shrine is made up of several counties, men from several counties in the shrine, like the, like the uh, Scottish Rite, for example, and unlike the York Rite, which is again local. You uh, mentioned that you were thrice potent master. Did you uh, have any other leadership positions in any of the appendant bodies? No, I, I have spent my time with Blue Lodge. Okay. Of all the appendant bodies, which ones did you seem to enjoy the most? The appendant bodies? Yep. Well, that, that's, a, that's a hard question. And the reason is that, uh, that I enjoyed, for example, the degrees in Scottish Rite very much. Uh, the, uh, and I participated in those degrees. Uh, uh, that is to say, uh, ac acting in the, in the portrayals. Uh, and... Uh, I also enjoyed the grotto. I've spent a lot of time in the grotto, and the reason is that is that it's the social arm for the lodges there in town. So I've spent a lot of time with them, and uh, my wife became active in the women's arm of the grotto, so that made that even stronger for me. You've, uh, over the years, received a lot of honors and awards. Are there a couple that are more memorable than others or more special, had a bigger impact? Well, as a background for this, let me tell you that this enzyme chemist from the University of Wisconsin brought me a problem that I knew I couldn't solve if it wasn't to go full-time in biophysics, which I did after about seven years at the university. And um, I lost track. What was the question? The yeah, honors and awards. Oh, honors and awards. The, he brought this problem to me, which, which I knew I couldn't solve except full-time. So uh, the problem was that he wanted to know the environment of the iron in the active center of a group of, uh, of uh, uh, proteins that are called electron transfer proteins, uh, ferrodoxins, because they had iron in them. But that's all they knew. They had iron and they had acid labile sulfur. By that means if you treated the protein with acid, you got H2S off. You could smell it. So they knew there was sulfur in the active site, and they knew from chemical experiments that there was iron in the active site, but that's all they knew. And they knew the molecular weight. That was it. Well, this was at a time when uh, crystallizing proteins was a black art, and they could not crystallize these proteins. 
So it meant if you were to get the structure of the active center, you had to do it by spectroscopy. Now, any one spectroscopy doesn't give you structure, but if you have a half a dozen or more, each of which tells you something about the nature of the active site, you can usually put a three-dimensional structure together. So that's what I did. And that's a rarity. That is not very often done. And uh, the result of that is, is I have had several nominations for the Nobel Prize by virtue of that, uh, of doing that uh, experiment. But uh, uh, needless to say, there's a long way from nomination to receiving. No, well, even being nominated is quite an honor. Um, tell me about some of the past grandmasters that you knew, maybe prior to the time that you were actually grandmaster. Uh, I th I'm going to begin this by telling you that when I was installed as master of my lodge, Wilfred Adams, who was then grandmaster, Royce Curlis, who was deputy, and John Polson, who was junior grand warden at the time, sorry, no, senior grand warden, uh, came to me at the installation and asked me if I could take the chairmanship of service and ed. And the reason was they wanted a professional teacher to be the chairman of service ned well i was just going in as master of my lodge which was an all-consuming task so i said i can't take the chairmanship this next year but uh, i'll join the committee and and uh, take the chairmanship the following year they said fine so that's what i did and they gave me all of the support i could possibly ask for uh, and the result of that was the Service and Ed Committee became very active. Uh, we were filling a serious void. There was no Masonic education in Michigan at the time. This was in the early 70s. Uh, and uh, uh, to show how bad it was, People didn't even understand the meaning of public grand honors. They had no understanding of this at all. It was just a, a, a exercise in gymnastics as far as they were concerned. Uh, and uh, so we began to teach about Freemasonry and the lodges just ate it up. And they ate us up. We, we started out by putting on programs from 9 to 4 every Saturday all over the state. I was as likely to be in Launch as I was in Detroit. Uh, I had to give up my, uh, m m uh, my tickets to the U of M football <laughs> because, <laughs> because I could never go to a football game. I was uh, busy all over the state. And, and what happened is not only were we busy on the weekends, but then the lodges began to ask us to come during the week and put on evening sessions at the district level. So we did that also. And um, so this really was an all-consuming task. I'm just grateful I had the time to do it. That's good. Well, you mentioned uh, Masonic education, and I know that's been your passion, and, and you were involved in the creation of several materials that most every lodge has in their uh, archives now. Tell us about some of those. Well, we began with Service and Ed in putting out uh, oh, 100 page pamphlets um, on planning for the East, for example, to help uh, the officer uh, as uh, wardens get ready for their term as master. And uh, we had another one on, on uh, Masonic education for the sidelines. Um, and uh, these uh, gradually I expanded. And when I was uh, Grand Master, I uh, came up with the idea of producing a manual, which was basically uh, how to do it for every phase of Freemasonry, no matter what it was. So uh, we put together a, a booklet, starting really when, when I was Grand Master, and uh, it wasn't distributed until Ernie Hoffman's year, who, who followed me. Uh, and this was given uh, to the lodges, and there were six uh, 
um, booklets given to the lodges, and those booklets are here. I don't know whether your camera can see these or not, but I'll hold it up. This this is a 500-page three-ring binder. Is that good enough? And um, this, uh, uh, this was uh, given to all of the lodges, six copies labeled Worshipful Master, Senior Warden, Junior Warden, uh, Senior Deacon, Junior Deacon, and Secretary. And uh, those, uh, uh, what happened there is that the, you might guess, the larger lodges totally ignored it. The smaller lodges took it as a Bible. And so the smaller lodges carry this big heavy thing around for a long time. <laughs> Finally, it's now available on CD, so you can get the whole manual on a CD. Uh, and, uh, but this is a practical how to do it. It's not the only way to do things, but it's a way. So it, it gives some guidance to the, to the Blue Lodge officers that have, haven't been there before. Then what happened is that we we needed to educate the newly made Masons. So, uh, so I put together a, uh, a volume which is, is called uh, the Beyond the Northeast Corner. We all know what that means, uh, having been there. And uh, th there are 19 chapters in this uh, and uh, four appendices. And nowadays these are available uh, in a uh, in three booklets, uh, Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason. The Entered Apprentice uh, has a uh, a printed booklet on the Entered Apprentice degree, telling the newly made Mason or reminding him several things that he was presented with in the Entered Apprentice degree, and then a CD with six uh, chapters of this book beyond the northeast corner. And then the Fellowcraft degree uh, has a printed booklet on the Fellowcraft degree again, and a, another CD with six more chapters of Beyond the Northeast Corner. And then finally, the Master Mason's degree has a section on, printed on the Master Mason's degree plus a CD with uh, with uh, what uh, seven uh, chapters on CD of the Beyond the Northeast Corner. And one of those chapters is, is uh, on available Masonic publications for, for future education. Uh, and so th that's, uh, that has been very well received. I've gotten a lot of feedback from the newly made Masons who have very much have enjoyed the Masonic education that's in these three packets. You had told me previously that uh, basically it was your passion for Masonic education that made you decide to run for Grand Lodge to make sure that that process continued. Yes, uh, I was chairman of Masonic, uh, the Masonic Service and Education Committee uh, until 1977, and uh, I uh, I ran for for Grand Line in in I believe '78. And you were Charlie Mothrop's Grand Marshal. Uh, yes, I was Charlie Mothrop's Grand Marshal. Very good. So as you progressed through the Grand Lodge line and later became Grand Master, was there anything that kind of surprised you about the process or about the job? My first surprise, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Let me step back a minute. As you're going up through the various uh, offices in Grand Lodge, uh, you primarily have an opportunity to visit the lodges and, and to learn about their various problems. Uh, but it's not until you're Grand Master that you have an opportunity to really do something about those. So that's where my efforts on the Michigan Masonic Manual, for example, came from during the, my year as Grand Master. Uh, and uh, but and that's where the surprises came. It wasn't so much a surprise as disappointments. I was very disappointed that 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 I I had to uh, eject uh, five 
Master Masons from the fraternity uh, because of their actions, which were highly unmasonic. That was very disappointing to me. I did not. I mean, I love Freemasonry. I love the high moral standards of Freemasonry, and it hurts when uh, when you find people that uh, th that uh, are absolutely dismal. I understand. So let's move forward to your year as Grand Master. Uh, tell us a few of the highlights of that year. Well, I should tell you, first of all, the following. I made a vow to myself that I would never give the same talk twice. Now, that is very hard to do. I managed to hold to that up to the very last month of my term as Grand Master, and I just didn't have the energy <laughs> to do it anymore. <laughs> But that was a joy. It really was a joy. And uh, several people came up to me and asked for copies of these talks. And I, I said, I'm sorry, you have to understand that, that that's all I can do to prepare them, let alone to have them printed out. So, so there are no printed copies of these talks. It's all up here. And, uh, um, but nevertheless, I enjoyed that and so did the membership. They, they, they never got bored. Uh, and uh, the I had many opportunities, uh, and it was those were real pleasures. For example, I had a private pilot who gave of his time and his airplane and his gasoline to fly me around the state of Michigan. He he flew me to the UP whenever I had to uh, meet the obligations up there, and in addition, I put about eighty thousand miles on a new car in the year that I was Grand Master. And very often I had upwards of three engagements a day, each of which required a talk uh, <laughs> and a change of clothing. So I, I uh, sometimes was traveling at 80 miles an hour down the highway, putting on a tuxedo or what have you, which is not the thing to do. But <laughs> You told me about one unique experience you had as Grand Master. You had the opportunity to visit the Grand Lodge of Japan. Yes, I was invited to visit the Grand Lodge of Japan. And uh, it's interesting because uh, MacArthur introduced uh, Freemasonry to Japan after the war. And uh, uh, so the lodges in Japan were in English. But when I went over there in, in uh, 1986, uh, about half of those lodges were converting to Japanese. And um, I spent a week in Japan, which was, uh, for me, paradise because I love sushi. So I had sushi morning, noon, and night. <laughs> My wife loves sushi. I don't. Um, tell me what you think the fraternity needs to prosper, to grow. In my opinion, what the fraternity needs is to give of itself to the community. Uh, in so doing, they're going to get the recognition that is going to bring membership, dedicated members to the fraternity. And uh, there are my own lodge, which happened, one of my lodges, I like to support the lodge and the community in which I live. So I belong to Milford Lodge, number 165 in Milford. And uh, we're trying something now as a service to the community. Uh, we happen to have some experts in computers and, and uh, in smartphones. And so we're starting this next month a session entitled uh, Getting the Most from Your Smartphone. And I've talked to several of the senior citizens in the community, and they are all enthusiastic about this. They really would be appreciative of anything in that direction. So this is a service that the lodges could offer simply because of all of the expertise that we have within the lodge. And that's a great idea. I like that idea. <clears throat> what would you tell somebody that came to you and said, I'm thinking about joining Freemasonry? What, would, what advice would you give them? to become extremely active, to dive in and participate, because it's only by participation that, that you uh, reap a harvest. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, uh, that uh, we have many 
members who join uh, Freemasonry, and that's the last we ever see of them. And that's a shame because not only do we not have the opportunity to receive their input, but they don't have an opportunity to get out of Freemasonry what they should. Every man needs something greater than himself to hang on to, and uh, the fraternity fortunately provides that. Uh, there's, whenever you're down and out, there's nothing like an arm around your shoulder lifting you up and telling you that's the way you go. Amazing. And that's what we get out of Freemasonry and the brotherhood that we have. And, and uh, that's an experience that you can only have if you dive in and participate. Agreed. What advice would you give uh, a man becoming Worshipful Master of his Lodge for the first time? Plan. Uh, it's amazing, but if you want to do a good job for your lodge, you need to provide them with activities uh, that are outside of the ritual work of lodge and to, to provide them with quality activities that they are going to profit from requires planning. There's just, you can't avoid it, all right? You have to have time to think about a subject, to find a good speaker, for example, or a good film or what have you. It all takes time and preparation. So the best advice is if you're going to be a master of your lodge is you need to plan your activities for your year well in advance. The second thing is you need to advertise them. The, we often see a situation where a lodge puts on a program that nobody knows anything about and so there's no attendance and it's a big flop. So, so advertising is uh, very important in, in Freemasonry. And, uh, and so is providing activities uh, that will be of profit to the membership. And that's what a, a master could do. Along those same lines, uh, what would you tell somebody that was coming to you and say, I think I'm going to run for Grand Lodge, what advice can you give me? First of all, you need to have a reason for running for Grand Lodge. In other words, you need to have the feeling that you have something to offer the craft that uh, they are not getting otherwise or wouldn't get otherwise. First thing. Second thing is that you need to have the time to devote because uh, Grand Lodge is extremely time consuming. And the reason for that is that it's first of all a big business. So uh, you need to learn the ins and outs of the financial aspects of, of Grand Lodge and that comes during the early years that you're in Grand Lodge line. Uh, you're learning constantly you don't really have an opportunity to produce something unique for the craft until you're Grand Master. But uh, that's, of course, an argument for why we ought to have more than one year as a Grand Master. It's a separate subject. Agreed. How has Freemasonry impacted your life? Uh, very much so. Uh, when, when I received my very first degree in Freemasonry, I realized that uh, somebody of tremendous intellectual ability had, uh, had composed this ritual. And the reason for that is it's taught by allegory. And it's very hard to do allegory. And uh, unfortunately, many of our men who go through the degrees of Freemasonry don't understand the lessons that are taught therein because they're taught by allegory. Uh, and and uh, so, but however, if you do, if you are sensitive to allegory and have the imagination to see what's really being said, uh, it's a tremendous experience. The uh, I remember very fondly the uh, chaplain of our lodge, who was a 95-year-old man. His voice quavered, but when he gave a prayer, 
or read a section out of the Bible, it was the wisdom of the ages. Tremendous impact on me as I was blindfolded listening to this. Yep. Any final reflections on the fraternity? Yes. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity to be of use to the community and to the country. But we are not meeting that responsibility. Uh, we really need to, uh, the lodges need to get involved with their community, uh, become very active in the activities of that community, and offer services to that community which, which they're uniquely able to do. And uh, I, uh, I think that this is, this is a tremendous opportunity that, that uh, should enthuse all of us. Very good. Well, Most Worshipful Brother Richard, we'd like to thank you for being with us today and for participating in our oral history program. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.